Good afternoon, Mr. Ambassador, Claire, Carol, and the four speakers of today's webinar. Uh, my name is Chayan Watanaputi. I am representing uh, RCSD of Chiang Mai University. It is my pleasure to be with you this, this afternoon. Uh, we, ERASECT and RCSD, working in collaboration to plan this web webinar for several months. And we would like to create a platform for academics, scholars, journalists, and interested individuals to discuss and exchange ideas regarding the critical political situation in Myanmar, which seem to have no viable solution now. The conflict between Tatmadaw on the one hand and the CDMers, as well as the ethnic armed groups on the other hand, still persists. The situation is also exacerbated by the recent COVID surge, which has taken many people's life. Uh, many people die because of the lack of health facilities, lack of health personnel in Myanmar and lack of oxygen. And I think uh, the situation is very, is our concern. We hope that uh, Today, in this important webinar, we will hear uh, the four distinguished speakers uh, who will provide uh, their in-depth analysis of the situation uh, in Myanmar and also share with us what would be the way out of these two crises which Myanmar is facing. We hope that uh, during this webinar, there will be a good interaction and exchange about challenges and hopes for the way forward. Thank you very much. Um, so, um... I am Claire Tran, director of IRASEC, um, an institute of research on Southeast Asia, contemporary Southeast Asia, based in Bangkok. Uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, Atantayan uh, and uh, Carol and all the speakers, I'm very pleased to co-organize with uh, the RCSD this debate on Myanmar, Myanmar almost six months after the coup. We deeply regret not being able to organize the event in Chiang Mai University. Nevertheless, the online, online format will offer us a chance to largely open the audience, in particular in Myanmar. So thank you very much for the translator um, who will translate all the debates. Uh, to organize this debate with Achan Chayan, the director of the Regional Center for Social Sciences and Sustainable Development is an evidence for us as we have a long-standing collaboration with him, we know how he dedicates his energy to develop cooperation and project to enhance knowledge in the Mekong region since decades, and since one decades in Myanmar in particular. As a founder of the conference on Burma, Myanmar studies, whose third edition took place last March, only one month after the coup, Atan Tayan, is the best partner to organize this debate on Myanmar. Our institute um, celebrates this year its 20 years, and we have uh, almost four French researchers working on Myanmar. And we had the opportunity to go to, to Yangon for different events, uh, in particular with the two uh, IRASEC participants today. Unfortunately, it's no more possible to, be, uh, uh, to, to, to work in Myanmar. But we are very pleased, thanks to Atan Chayan, to, to organize this conference with our colleague uh, from Myanmar and to also have the opportunity to have a large audience also uh, in Myanmar. And I would like uh, to finish to, just to thank a lot Atan Chayan and his team, uh, to thank the French uh, ambassador of France, Christian Le Chervis, 
for accepting to open the debate. Uh, it's a great honor for us to have you uh, in this uh, uh, debate. And I thank also the four speakers and last, last but not least, Caroli Zhu, journalist, for being with us tonight. Uh, and to, to help us to better understand the situation in Myanmar today, uh, to see the difficult challenges and also the, the hopes for uh, a way forward. And we all are deeply concerned about all the Burmese people and its youth in particular, who suffered so much since uh, these six months uh, because of civil war and the context of uh, worsening of the pandemic. Thanks to all of you for attending the meeting and for your participation in the debate. Uh, so, um, um, Ambassador Le Charvi, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to thank uh, USAC in Bangkok and uh, RCSSD uh, in Chiang Mai University for organizing this uh, afternoon seminar, uh, especially because the Myanmar crisis is no longer at the earth of international and even uh, regional uh, news. But it uh, still requires our full intentions because it's not a crisis like uh, others. It's not just one more crisis in a country where there have been numerous crises since the independence in January 1948. The current crisis constitute a real historic break. It turns a country in on itself and restore institutional and economic practice that were abolished for the five to 10 years. The February 1st putsch put on the end to 10 years of democratic transitions. It didn't just stop the story. It made the futures disappear. From now on, Burmese and uh, foreigners see the future of Myanmar only in the blink or a very uncertain way. The military coup shattered the hopes of an entire society. It's not the illusions of a generation that have vanished, it also an entire populations. This desperations fuel today's the civil war. Thousands of people are convinced that their future depends only on the fate of arms. They are ready for the ultimate sacrifice and enlist in a self-defense group. And we observe that a one, more than 100 of this group emerged since mid-April. They are ready for the ultimate sacrifice and uh, the blood uh, is wrong. In a few weeks, a world particle culture of no violence is fading and which will fundamentally change the political perspective of the country. These new fighters are to be taken very seriously. Of course, they have no military experience. They have few weapons. However, the Tatmado was enabled to sweep them aside in a matter of weeks. In the Xin state, or even in the Kaya state, the Naipido army suffered serious military setback. In Bama region, like Sagang or even Mandalay, is done on meet with more success. It's difficult to measure the internal effect of this failure, but they are already fueling the hours of dirty wars. The use of extrajudicial killing, the mobilization of new militia, the recruitment of chilled soldiers are just few examples of the new hours. The dynamic of civil war drive the country into fear. Not only do the Myanmar no longer have confidence in their future, they are again viscerally suspicious of each others. They are no longer trust each others. The fear of being denounced for one's real or supposed political activities, patch social relations. Informants, Dalan, are people to kill. Social revenge is expressed without restraints, especially on social media. A hateful society is being built before our eyes. 
this distrust between individual feed and an even greater distrust of institutions. This is noticeable vis-a-vis the state, especially its education and else Peter. The citizens are moving away from it and want to have nothing to do with it. This distrust has spread to the banking and the financial system. The coup has weakened the state, the state as a whole. As in the past, the military can no longer count on the unwarring support of the bureaucrats. The civil disobedience movement, the CDM, have created a huge wedge between the stock and the state, between the army chief and the civil servant. The state apparatus is viewed with widespread suspicions. Some are suspicious of its an army relay, others see it as official was sympathies with house authorities. But finally, many note its dysfunction due to the human resources weakened by mass layoff for political uh, reasons. The putsch weakened the state and weakens the authority of the state. This weakening of confidence in the state weakens the legitimacy of the coup plotter, but it is a strategy at a time of a determined fight necessity against the COVID-19. The citizen no longer has confidence in the public word, the information that this is given. Public policy are not complement. Contrary to what they often suggest, the military cannot afford to take the place of failing civilian administrations. In this context, 171 days after the establishment of the State Administration Council, the following first assessment can be made. The military coup had a very high human cost, very similar to the bloody events of 1988. Hundreds of people lost their life or were injured. Thousands were thrown in prison. The economy is in the worst recessions in 33 years. Investors freeze or abandon their project. All major infrastructure projects are still standby. And, if he, and the majority of the project of connectivity was the other Southeast Asian country, India, or even China, are stopped. Companies are clothing branch and recalling their expatriate employees. The effect of February 1st coup will be noticeable for several years and probably well beyond the two years of the state of emergency. The statistic only partially reflects the consequence of the February 1st putsch. The future seems to have been put on all. The feeling of being faced with an impasse is accentuated by the general minimum length inability to define an, an alternative government project to respond to the health and economic emergency. To demonstrate also an ability to broaden its political base, even on the international arena, including in Asia. Finally, in concrete term, the new regime struggle to be recognized as the, the, the legitimate government of the Republic of Union of Myanmar. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for this uh, insightful and uh, brave speech. It's uh, not easy these days to engage uh, top diplomats on the matter. So I wanted to uh, once again, uh, particularly thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, thank you, Ajahn Chayan. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, uh, all uh, brilliant uh, four panelists that I will uh, introduce uh, gradually. The objective of uh, the debate uh, tonight is to try to grasp uh, the reality, the extent of uh, the crisis unfolding in Myanmar right now, whether it is the health crisis, uh, the political crisis, the economic uh, crisis, but also to try, hopefully, to offer some views, some leads uh, for 
a way out of this crisis. And this is the title of this debate, Myanmar Crisis, Hopes and Challenges for a Way Forward. Uh, I would like to invite uh, all four panelists to uh, switch on their cameras uh, right now, if possible, to, to be uh, with us all uh, during the, the debate. Yes, hello, everybody. Thank you for, to the audience to be here too. You will be able to ask questions uh, starting from about 6, 6.15, 6 6.30 in the worst case, depending on how things go uh, with the debate tonight. But I promise you there will be space uh, for questions from the floor. Uh, without further ado, I would like to start this debate uh, with um, some of the tragic news uh, getting out of uh, Myanmar these last few days. And of course, I'm talking about the health uh, crisis, um, 286 dead people only for the day of yesterday in 24 hours, and those are only official numbers, uh, no mass testing is being conducted right now, so uh, we uh, this gives us a remote idea of the reality of the crisis. So I would like to try to have an idea uh, of the extent of this crisis, but also, and maybe more relevantly to our debate, what does this health crisis change to um, the civil disobedience movement and for the next future of the country? I, I would like maybe to uh, start uh, with you, uh, Minzin. Um, you are a uh, you the founder of a independent uh, think tank, Burmese uh, think tank, uh, that is called um, excuse me um, yes the Institute for Strategy and Policy. Uh, you are also a PhD candidate in uh, the Department of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, you are also a, a colleague of mine because you write uh, for prestigious media outlet like the New York Times. So thank you uh, for being with us tonight. About this health crisis, um, first maybe also from personal anecdotes, maybe from uh, families in front of the ground, what is today the reality of this health crisis? What does it change uh, for the civil disobedience movement? Um, first of all, like, let me thank uh, for having me um, uh, in, at this event. Um, I think um, it's, uh, that the situation, especially the COVID-19 situation in Myanmar right now, uh, is, is reaching to the level of humanitarian, serious humanitarian imperative humanitarian crisis. So you can see this in three different uh, arena. One is the testing capacity, as you already mentioned, which is like so low and so weak. The second thing is the treatment capacity, which is, uh, as the Argentine already noted, uh, you know, even people are, you know, lining up, you know, uh, in the very crowded long queue to refill their oxygen uh, cylinders, you know, without regarding uh, social distance, because they need to save their family members. I mean, like when you when you ask me about my uh, personal, uh, you know, like uh, uh, experience, uh, my two uh, cousin sisters passed away uh, in past five days uh, from COVID nineteen, and also my uh, the the fellow colleagues in ISP Myanmar, at least fourteen of them, they are in their twenties, infected with the COVID-19. All of these cases have now been reported in the, in the military uh, statistic. So um, I can tell you in terms of testing capacity, in terms of treatment capacity, in terms of vaccination strategy, all in three areas, everything is weak and ad hoc. And then the, 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 the military does not receive the public trust. I think when you, when you are facing this kind of serious public health care crisis, you really need political legitimacy to mobilize public goodwill, to mobilize public cooperation to address the problem. Right now, what military is lacking is public legitimacy. That's a major problem. So this type of you know, crisis is, uh, you can see in five different domains. One is a public health care system. You know, all these public hospitals are like collapsed, basically all, almost nearly collapsing because of that, you know, the, the lack of cooperation from the healthcare workers. 
And then the second is private sectors. Military is also putting a lot of pressure on the, the like oxygen, uh, uh, you know, like uh, factories, you know, to to not to supply the private, uh, just only to supply the public hospital and the military. So these these are the, the, the serious issue. The third is the community uh, community initiative. The, the, the issue is uh, many volunteers, about fifty thousand volunteer that it came out and helped people in the first and second wave. These networks are now in disarray because many of them took part in the, the, the you know, like the, the civil resistance, you know, protest movement, some of them being killed, some of them are in the, in the prison, some of them are on the run. So all these volunteer networks, that's so crucial for the country like Myanmar, which has very weak institutional capacity. We need to rely on the community, right? This is, that's why the WHO is calling for the, the whole of the society approach, which has been lacking because of this, this social fabric has been destroyed. And then the, uh, and then the, 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 the fourth one is uh, ethnic uh, regions. Ethnic armed control regions, usually they have a very good uh, healthcare infrastructure because of cross-border assistance and all others, you know, sophisticated, you know, even though they are struggling for their own autonomy, they are quite sophisticated in terms of uh, the, the, the healthcare uh, infrastructure, but they are now under serious pressure, especially under the airstrike from the military hunter. So I think that, that that's also under heavy stress. And the last one is family level and individual level coping system, which is also a very serious uh, under, uh, under like stress, mainly because of the economy is like seriously shrinking. Even though you have money in your own bank, you cannot go and withdraw money from the ATM, right? Because of the banking, you know, like crisis. And then the, 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 the not only economy, but also, you know, uh, the, the food crisis is, 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 is coming because of that, you know, food shortage. Uh, I mean, the blue FP already predicted, you know, 3.4 million or so people will go hunger. So, and then UN already predicted about like more than 50% of, about 50% of population will go under poverty line. So I think that all of these sectors are under serious uh, crisis. That's why I think we can, we can call it like humanitarian imperative, humanitarian crisis. That's what we need to address right away. Thank you. Uh, maybe um, Mayu Mutro, um, you have something to, to, to add about this with um, like echoes from the ground. Uh, you are a research scholar uh, um, at the Lotharch uh, Research Center for International Law at uh, Cambridge uh, University. You are also an advisor to the Salwa Institute and uh, advisor to the Karen National Union. Uh, something to add maybe about this uh, health uh, crisis currently unfolding and maybe also what is the attitude of the of the generals regarding this uh, this uh, crisis? Are they themselves overwhelmed by it? Are they conveniently uh, as people might suggest, letting people die in some particularly rebellious areas. Uh, what is the attitude of uh, the army? And what does this health crisis change for the next future of the civil disobedience movement? Uh, May Umotro. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ironically, I did my uh, gradu my first graduate uh, degree in law. I did I wrote a thesis on public health, uh, and I studied malaria. So I, when I look at the situation right now, uh, I think uh, everything that uh, Minzin has said, uh, in terms of uh, public health care, the crisis in public health care, uh, and also in public health uh, sphere. Uh, it's uh, what I see is uh, his uh, the the history repeating itself, but the, unfortunately, the first part of the history wasn't even it wasn't even ended, and uh, we are repeating uh, the same situation, uh, but in a different uh, format. So uh, when I did my study on malaria, it was also equally a public health crisis. Uh, in the, I study uh, my case study was focused on the civil, mostly um, so malaria prevalent uh, regions are mostly non Burma ethnic uh, minority states and mostly uh, under the, uh, the resistance uh, resistance movements control. So when you look at those areas, the uh, public health there there was uh, no uh, state controlled public health program. 
And uh, the data suggested that uh, each year, malaria, people died, more people died from malaria than even in the war zone, more people died from malaria than uh, the actual fighting, uh, in the actual fightings. So that was uh, something, a notion that we, I was familiar with. And now we are looking at the situation with the pandemic uh, uh, situation in the country. Uh, I, it, I, I don't know how to express the sadness. Uh, at the same time, I must also admit it's, uh, it's anger that uh, the situation is much worse, yes. And um, it's getting into, like Ms. Uh, de uh, described, uh, disastrous, uh, uh, disastrous uh, situation. And I don't know how, uh, you asked me how the generals uh, feel. Looking back at the situation uh, during the crisis with malaria, uh, when the fightings were intense, uh, very intense, and uh, when um, many refugees were uh, fleeing into uh, neighboring countries uh, around that time, uh, the generals uh, care less about. So we, I studied from the constitutional point of view, I studied the rights of the people, how state uh, takes responsibility uh, in terms of addressing public health issues, promoting public health and providing health care. And the state, at, and at that time, the state, uh, uh, what my finding was the state failed constitutionally. But now when we look at the situation, uh, this, uh, it's like I said, it's worse. So this is uh, the, these generals, more or less the same generals, but definitely the same institution is looking at the country and perhaps uh, they are thinking this is, this is one opportunity, one golden opportunity for them to, uh, to, to validate uh, their, their power. Uh, because they, they seized the power on February 1 and pandemic, it was pandemic time. But this, uh, this third wave hitting uh, the country uh, and you are seeing, we are talking about how lack, uh, how public, uh, public trust is lacking. Public did not trust the, 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 reg the, the regime from the beginning. But now with what they are doing on daily basic, uh, what the troops are do doing on the daily basic in the arena of health. The, impossible, I don't even see the possibility to amend the trust. And uh, how, they, how do they feel? Uh, I, I think the generals probably underestimate the effect and the danger of pandemic. And that is in part uh, lack of uh, knowledge uh, the capacity, uh, lack of capacity to understand the, the depth of the pandemic, uh, to appreciate the crisis that public, uh, the crisis in the public health field. Uh, so they think that they can, or it's like other health problems, uh, people will suffer, people will die, and then things will uh, bounce back. But this is pandemic. So I think uh, it's very dangerous. I do not uh, expect uh, the generals to be any more sympathetic than the uh, sympathetic and any more humane than they <laughs> they had been uh, the, the past uh, decades. Uh, but uh, as to the situation and how the public, uh, the CDM, uh, uh, people participating in the CDM, uh, this is uh, very. Uh, it is understanding understatement to say that it is very damaging to trust building, any possibility uh, to build tr trust between the state and the people. And uh, meaning right now we are talking about the state, the Dumbledore as the state, uh, the institution as the state. Uh, but uh, at, at the same time, it is uh, the, uh, the Dumbledore, the, the, the military generals underestimating the the damage that this public health crisis is causing. Uh, it's also hurting the future that we haven't even achieved yet. Thank you very much. Um, uh, other panelists on, on that, but but uh, you uh, maybe, uh, um, Min Zinju, would you like to, to, to react on that? About the fact that several, um, the Tamado already gave several hints that uh, maybe something was up and that finally the coup is the result of 
uh, a deterior deteriorating relationship that um, happened like uh, way before the coup, or, or was that a, a, a surprise? I think um, many observers who follow the news and the press conferences of the, 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 the military spokesperson, and then also the commander in chief uh, himself. Um, I mean, we would tend to um, uh, kind of like uh, expect the military, uh, if they, um, they're, they're not happy with the outcome of the election. This is what the, 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 the commander in chief uh, made online, made it very clear, um, the, you know, like um, the, 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 the transfer of power might not be a, a matter of certainty, right? So um, that he already hinted uh, before election and even after election when uh, the, the military, uh, you know, like started, you know, charging or alleging the NLD uh, to commit the, the fraud, right? So, the, so that, 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 you know, um, kind of atmosphere of generating that, you know, the military uh, might intervene when they find uh, the outcome the dis disappointing. So like, so for us, uh, uh, I even myself wrote an article um, uh, a few days before, I mean, five or seven days before the coup. Um, um, my, my argument is this, you know, um, military might stage coup as a, one of the scenarios. I outlined, I think, three scenarios at the time. Uh, military may stage coup, but that is mainly because of the, the copy of that high model. Thailand model, they, 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 they feel like they need to revise their veto power, even though they enshrined a lot of military prerogative and then and privileges in the 2008 constitution, they found themselves pretty uh, uh, incompetent vis-a-vis -vis Dong, San Suu Kyi and NLD in terms of winning public heart and mind. So I think that's, that's why they, are, they, they feel like imperative to revise their the, the veto power. That's what the original concept. That's why I think Mayor Online, the commander in chief, framed frame the coup as a palace coup with the, between the conflict between the military and the NLD. But it turned out to be totally different the way that he did not expect because the public rose up and then the whole nation you know, got outraged. And then, as uh, the, one of the speakers said, you know, the, the, the younger generation feel that their futures are being stolen. So I think the whole, the whole consequence are, are, are different from what the, the coup maker wanted the country to respond. In terms of what the coup uh, change and uh, immediately uh, change for the future of, of Myanmar, I would like uh, maybe to take a, a legal approach uh, right now with uh, you, uh, Dr. Remy uh, NVN. You're also an associate researcher at the IRASEC. You're the founder of the Myanmar Law Library. Uh, you also have a law firm uh, in uh, Yangon. And uh, you wrote a thesis, actually, on the codification of civil law in Myanmar. Um, in terms of legal changes that happened right after the coup, and what they mean uh, for Burmese society, what kind of change uh, they imply for Burmese society. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Remy Um Hello, everyone. Mingalaba, Samad Dikha. Uh, first of all, I would like to take this uh, opportunity uh, to thank RCSD, the Regional Center for Social Science and Student Sustainable Development, based in uh, Chiang Mai, through Achan Chayan and uh, IRSEC based in Bangkok through uh, Ms. Claire Tran for co-organizing co this virtual debate. Uh, many thanks uh, to you, uh, Carol, for leading this uh, virtual debate. Uh, it's an honor to have the opportunity to participate in this event with the following participants. Uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Ambassador Christian Le Chervy, uh, Ms. Or Candier, Ms. Meou Moutreau, and Ms. Mr. Minzin. Uh, concerning the legal uh, consequences after the coup, uh, on 1st uh, February 2021, uh, the Tadmado did not comply with the section 418A and section 421 of the constitution of 2008. Um, normally, 
the president is the one who can declare the state of emergency and the one who can declare the transferring of legislative, executive, and judicial powers of the union to the commander in chief of the, of the defense services. In fact, the president Uwin Min has been arrested. Therefore, we can consider that it was a coup and the appointment of a president pro tempore, as a general Min Aung Lane stated in, the, in a speech on 7 April 2021 is actually wrong. Uh, I observed that the Tanmado has a great uh, knowledge of the legislative procedure. In less than a month, with approximately 100 orders, SAC appointed members of the government, state administration council, judiciary institutions such as the uh, Constitution Tribunal, the Anti-Corruption Commission, the Myanmar National uh, Human Rights Commission, or the Central Bank of Myanmar. The main idea uh, of the Tanmado is to show the continuity of the functioning of the administration. In re response to the coup, um, the CRPH has been uh, created and declared the SAC as a terrorist uh, group on 1st March 2021. The SAC replied and considered that CRPH and its various organizations have committed a high treason regarding the section uh, 122 of the penal code. They can be punished uh, with death penalty, life sentence, or 22 years of imprisonment. And on 8 uh, May 2021, the Anti-Terrorism Central Committee declared that the CRPH and uh, the NUG are terrorist groups. Uh, and before the Ministry of Home Affairs uh, has already declared them as illegal associations on 21 March 2021. So regarding the reaction of the population after the coup, the SAC has uh, enacted a notification on 26 February 2021 in order to uh, remind people from uh, CDM not to threat uh, civil service regarding various sections of penal code, uh, such as section 124D, 186, 189, not to detain and not to beat the civil service, uh, which is punished under the section uh, 332, 333, 342 uh, of the penal code. And um, regarding your, your first uh, question, uh, Carol, uh, about the current COVID-19 situation, uh, for four months, uh, the SAC opened files against health staff that participated in CDM activity under the section 505A of the penal code. And on 13 July uh, 2021, so uh, let's say, let's say last week, uh, even if uh, MOHS asked some applicants to apply to be employed in the medical um, uh, service, uh, I can imagine, uh, such as uh, uh, Ms. Meu Moutreau uh, said, that trust does not uh, exist anymore uh, between uh, civilians in healthcare sector and the TADMADO. Uh, moreover, uh, it would be hard to employ people regarding the conditions of the application. Uh, the applicants must not have a criminal record and should provide a criminal clearance letter from the relevant police station under the Myanmar police force. This notification by MOHS for hiring assistant surgeons or nurses seems to be too late regarding the current COVID-19 situation in Myanmar. Uh, furthermore, uh, it is very difficult to find and to import medicines. Importers are facing many issues with customs and the Tanmado needs medicine for their own hospitals. And the cost of various medicines is very expensive uh, and even doctors and pharmacists cannot provide medicines uh, against COVID-19 to their relatives. I uh, would like to uh, emphasize that the penal code is a, a very good tool for SAC in order to control the population. Uh, the SAC amends the penal code and the criminal procedure code in the purpose to control the civil service and the communication against the government. In March 2021, uh, the SAC enacted martial law so that transfers the executive and judiciary uh, powers to the commander of the Yangon Command to exercise a martial law in some townships in Yangon. They wanted to protect some industrial areas, but also to show people that martial law is implemented in special circumstances, comparing the laws enacted in February 2021. Actually, martial law uh, was already applied since the coup. 
Uh, concerning the human rights uh, under the section 420 of the constitution uh, of 2008, uh, the commander in chief of the defense services may during the duration of the declaration of the state of emergency restrict or suspend as required one or more fundamental rights of the citizens in the required area. In this regard, on 13 February 2021, the SAC suspended the sections five, seven, and eight of the law protecting the privacy and security of the citizens. What those sections are? Under the section five of this law, the relevant ministry and responsible authority shall ensure that there is no damage to the privacy and security of the citizen, except where there is occurred in accordance with existing law. When acting in accordance with existing law, not enter into a person's residence or room used as a residence or building compound or building in a compound for the purpose of search, seizure or arrest, unless accompanied by minimum of two witnesses. Under the section seven of the law protecting the privacy and security of the citizens, no one shall be detained and more than, um, for more than 24 hours without permission from a court unless the detention is in accordance with existing law. And under section eight of this law, uh, in the absence of an order, permission or warrant issue in accordance with existing law or permission from the union president uh, uh, or a union level um, government body, no one shall enter into a citizen's private residence or room used as a residence or building compound or building in a compound. Um, uh, no, no person shall have their communication with another person or communications equipment intercepted or disturbed with in any way. Uh, no one shall demand or obtain personal telephonic or electronic communication data from teleco telecommunication operator. Moreover, on 15 February 2021, the SAC enacted a law amending the electronic transaction law. The Dr. Anguyen, I'm sorry, I would, I would have to ask you to, to finish on the uh, one minute, your, 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 your intervention. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and, uh, the before purpose we have time of, for other uh, topics. No problem, yeah. Um, the purpose of, of this law is to seize um, personal data and to prevent any kind of information share on the internet. Therefore, the SAC knows perfectly how to control the institutions in the country and they legally authorize within several months the deaf, arrested and displaced people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, extensive um, view of the, the legal changes that happened right after the coup. Uh, we are running a little bit behind schedule. We still have uh, different topics uh, to talk about. One that is uh, quite important that, that had a very high, very uh, great momentum uh, a few weeks, a few months after the coup that um, unfortunately, uh, some would say uh, had, has lost a little bit of uh, momentum uh, because of this health crisis. I'm uh, talking about uh, the topic of federalism. Uh, this word was thrown around a lot um, in, the, in the first few weeks. Um, I would like to really have a practical approach on what this uh, federalism could mean in the Burmese context. You know, federalism is a very wide term that uh, can actually um, represent many kind of government. So I would really like to have uh, a practical approach uh, in the Burmese uh, context. Uh, but first, uh, before simply, as for an outsider, when we talk about federalism, when we talk about a Burmese federal union uh, in the Burmese context, what does it mean? What uh, are the priorities? What ethnic minorities uh, need exactly? Are we talking about control of uh, natural resources? Are we talking about uh, national regional languages being taught into schools? Are we talking about a political representation? What are the main demands, what is this uh, Burmese Federal Union that we are talking about in a practical point of view, Mayu? Uh, <clears throat> if we talk about, if we did talk about federalism, uh, Burmese federalism in the context of uh, control over natural resources, we are 
uh, we are making a, a big mistake uh, by reducing uh, the, the, the problem uh, that uh, the problem that uh, we, we instead of being able to solve it, uh, we are deepening it. Uh, and likewise, uh, if we only talk about language and uh, religions uh, in, uh, in the context of Burmese federalism, it is also reduction of the, pro uh, uh, the, the bigger problem. Uh, but uh, when we talk about, instead, when we talk about Burmese federalism, uh, definitely it, it is uh, the, the, the addition of many inconveniences. Uh, because it requires dramatic and radical change in the status quo, uh, which we many of us don't even realize. Uh, on the other hand, we are talking about the existence of people as they are. That would include languages, faith, uh, ethnicity, uh, and um, of course, control over natural resources. But control over natural resources, I think it actually, if you study Burmese uh, current political crisis, it came very late. Uh, the, the, the struggle uh, over the control of the natural resources in respective ethnic states came in very late. Many other problems that um, uh, that ripped uh, the country, that 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 had uh, raped the country from any possibility of uh, unity, uh, being united, being prosperous, all those things. Uh, it it came from the rejection of people, and I I think uh, because we have for, personally, I have talked about this for many many years, for 10, 15 years. 20 years, uh, I feel like I'm repeating myself and it sounds redundant to me, but it, it's, it would be, um, uh, you, would be you would be surprised uh, to learn actually when you go to Myanmar and in, uh, interact with the people of all uh, different background, different ethnic, uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic groups, how little tolerance we have of each other ling ling linguistically, uh, culturally and whatnot. And I think this kind of rejection of one another, uh, I think that this is the problem. So when we talk about federalism, it is the recognition of all these people as they are linguistically, culturally and whatnot. And then we, yes, uh, the natural resources and other things, are, it's the, the aftermath, it's a side dish of political, the, the, the greater, the bigger political problems. Uh, so I, I think, um, and this, if we, as soon as we talk, we imagine uh, a Burmese federal, uh, federalism. Is there reason to hope that Burmese society is ready to change on, the, on these topics? And uh, for example, when you look at the, the, the NUG, the National Unity Government, this, uh, as we know, self-proclaimed uh, government in exile that exists in parallel to the military government today, does this government reflect the possibility of a new Burmese society? Or does it reflect the remaining problems to you? I know it's a, it's a, a lot of opinion I'm asking here, but uh, anyway. But I, I think when I talk about Burmese society, I don't exclude uh, the N people in the NUG. Uh, they are very much actually uh, at the moment, the face of the Burmese society. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, the intolerance, uh, the rejection, uh, they, they bear the responsibility, uh, they, uh, probably because they also claim to uh, have uh, claimed to, they claim to have the, uh, they claim their legitimacy on these people, the society, the people in the society. They also bear the, the, the probably the biggest uh, responsibility in terms of uh, having this uh, type of society, uh, into intolerant society. So when we talk about uh, federalism, I think this is um, maybe there are uh, different groups of people that bears different responsibility, a different level of responsibility, but we all are responsible. We all need to make a little bit of adjustment but some of us more some of us would have to make a bigger adjustment more adjustment than others but we all need to make a little bit of adjustment uh, in our respective areas because things will have to change things as it was like the uh, 
uh, the previous uh, speaker, the historian, I, I, I'm sorry, uh, I could not uh, pronounce the name, uh, said that uh, we it, we cannot just uh, we cannot talk about uh, Burmese federalism and uh, enjoying ourselves in that past. Uh, 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 situation, the state of the past. Yeah? So, and uh, also the, the colonial legacy. Um, colonial legacy is one issue, but the, the big, I think there, uh, there are other bigger issues uh, that uh, the, the extreme nationalisms, uh, uh, yes, it's also the, the impact of the colonial, uh, the, it's the, the colonial legacy as well. But I think colonial legacy after 80 years, 70 years, uh, almost 80 years now, after 70 years, uh, colonial legacy, the Burmese people could have chosen to leave once and for all the colonial legacy. It's not that easy to be uh, to, to do it. Uh, but I think having experienced 70 years of civil war, if we learn any lesson at all, we can, the first thing we could dump willingly or we should be able to dump willingly is the colonial legacy. I, I will, uh... We have a lot of questions from the floor, and I know uh, there's, there's normally a dedicated uh, space at the end of it, but because we have some relevant questions right now, I will allow myself to, 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 to ask a few, uh, because we have a, a question that has just arrived about the possibility of a civil war today uh, in Myanmar, and uh, maybe the, 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 the rise of these ethnic minorities, uh, the space given to these ethnic minorities' revendication and the the harsh opposition to the Tatma Dao. Is there today a real possibility of a civil war? We have seen events uh, recently and uh, also in the current state, but not only, of course, but we have seen many events that uh, look like a civil war. What are the risks today of uh, a civil war in, in, in Myanmar? I don't know if uh, May Wu, you want to, to, to steal, or maybe uh, Min Zin, uh, uh, or maybe both, maybe let us have a, a quick answer to, to, to both, but what, what is your opinion about the risk of a civil war today in Myanmar? Uh, I will quickly say that uh, the, I think uh, civil war, how do we define civil war, right? But uh, I think however uh, we define it, uh, what we are looking at right now is the expansion of civil war into uh, the cities and uh, whatnot, all over the spreading, along with the pandemic, the COVID-19, the spreading of civil war is as much pandemic uh, as the COVID-19 itself. So unfortunately, uh, my uh, answer would be uh, Burma is experiencing two different types of pandemic at the same time. Minzin, uh, do you have something to add to this on the on the risk of uh, civil war in your country right now? I don't know much. I will second uh, me. Uh, I think uh, civil civil war has been in, 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 in Burma for many years, right? For six, seven decades, and and what we are seeing now now is more like urban armed insurrection. Uh, you know, like uh, I'm not sure whether the geopolitical condition, uh, and, and, you know, uh, in, in the region will uh, will be conducive uh, for that type of uh, urban insurrection to be sustainable. And, and you know, it's a lot of questions we have to address. But uh, one thing we can tell is that the, the people got so frustrated and so um, so outrageous, so that they they are they are so determined to resort to any means uh, available out there to uh, to resist uh, against the autocracy and military dictatorship. But uh, I think uh, for 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 a sort of from the political science point of view, uh, to categorize this as a like you know, you know all out civil war uh, is so premature. But I would say civil war has been more like low intensity uh, for many years. But in recent years, especially after military coup, it has been um, quite um, activated again in some areas. And now we see more urban arms uh, insurrection. I will have. A, I will want to to, to stay a, a few more minutes with you, uh, Menzin, because we have also question about the attitude of the Asian countries, and that was anyway our uh, next uh, topic on the, the the on our roadmap. So um, one of the question is: I see no action of Asian on the grounds, but however, Asian has consensus with Minong Line. If um, 
is 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 uh, currently uh, Myanmar um, radicalizing? I mean, uh, could you say a few words about the this uh, this attitude of, of the Asian countries? I mean, given the the current situation with the crisis that the the the, the country is going through now. There could be a refugee crisis. There could be uh, many problems, health problems, sanitary problems. So the neighbors should feel concerned about the, the crisis in Myanmar. However, it seems that although the Asian has several meetings about it, quite not a lot came out of these meetings. Or maybe it's a misperception. Can you can you give us a, a, a few words about? Uh, why it seems so difficult to the Asian to um, speak in one voice and to really wait on this uh, Myanmar crisis today? I think first and foremost, we need to make it clear that we cannot expect too much out of ASEAN. You know, ASEAN as an institution is, is very um, uh, uh, weak in terms of norms, uh, in terms of you know, like um, the actual coordination uh, in terms of resource and capacity, pretty weak. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are good at talking and that's the best way to keep uh, each other uh, from fighting. And that's a, the, the typical description about uh, of ASEAN. But uh, at the same time, ASEAN this time managed to come up with the five point consensus, which is quite impressive to me because uh, you all know in ASEAN, you have that more uh, continental, like mainland Southeast Asia, and then more maritime Southeast Asia. I mean, there's a clear uh, 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 disagreement uh, between two camps, mainly one side is more, you know, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, more pro, you know, authoritarian and like, authoritarian uh, in nature. But on the other hand, like Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and like, Singapore are so more, uh, uh, more, you know, like more, you know, semi, semi democracy, I would say. So to me, um, ASEAN five point consensus is, uh, is a good start because the uh, UN Security Council also uh, endorse or support ASEAN uh, initiated when it comes to Myanmar. Uh, that's important because the Chinese uh, is also delegate uh, the role of ASEAN uh, to play uh, to play in Myanmar conflict. But but it's, it's very important since Myanmar people are not ready, not willing to embrace any external mediation effort. Myanmar people, both sides, you know, all sides maybe. Um, have, they, they, they see the conflict is not reaching uh, to a point of mutually hardened stalemate. They don't feel that they need to come to the compromise and negotiation. So that's why I think external, you know, like international community will step back and then intentionally, deliberately adopt the strategy of deliberate slowdown. So that, you know, let them uh, actors to exhaust themselves. When they got exhausted, and then they will find a way to intervene. So that's why I think that, that from the United States to India, to China, to Japan, to ASEAN, uh, 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 quite slowing down their involvement vis-a-vis uh, -vis Myanmar. So that's why it's so important for Myanmar to, to, to use ASEAN five-point consensus, especially in the context of COVID third wave, because one of the ASEAN five point consensus is uh, the number four point is about to use AHA, ASEAN Coordination Center for the, the Humanitarian Assistance, to use AHA to provide humanitarian assistance to Myanmar. So I think the Myanmar stakeholders need to seize this and then use this to demand the ASEAN to play a role, right? To, 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 to intervene humanitarian, you know, like, uh, intervention in Myanmar, especially in the context of COVID-19, because ASEAN has a precedent. When you look at the 2008, you know, Cyclone Nagis, ASEAN used to support, especially at that time, Dr. Surin Pesuwan played a critical role. Right now, I think ASEAN or United Nations could appoint um, the humanitarian envoy to mobilize, use ASEAN as a friend, but we all know ASEAN doesn't have a capacity. That's why we need to mobilize UN, we need to mobilize Japan, uh, China, all of these resources, UK, US, to, to support, uh, the, the, to alleviate Myanmar 
uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, because which has is, which is regional implication. Yes, Minzin, you, you just mentioned China. I would like to, to have a, a final question with you. Uh, let's dig a bit um, around the, the role of China. A lot has been said about China, uh, like you say, uh, an authoritarian regime by nature uh, should uh, support more the, 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 the military regime. Is that so true? Where is China standing right now in the... Um, In the, in, the, in the Myanmar crisis, uh, what kind of relationship uh, would Chinese government have before with the NLD government? What does the coup change for China? And thus, what is actually uh, maybe behind so, some cliche we can have? What is today uh, the actual position of China on, on the Myanmar crisis? I think to, to, to make it uh, the, quite clear, China did not support the military coup. China was perfectly happy with Dong San Suu Kyi and the Temedo partnership prior to the military coup. Because that partnership was somehow pro-China, pro-ASEAN value, Asian value, which is more hierarchical, you know, authoritarian, personalized, you know, leader, uh, uh, political leader, and, and also, uh, which is somehow anti-minority. So uh, I think China was perfectly fine with that Dosu, Dong San Suu Kyi and that That, 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 you know, like the military partnership. So they always wanted, you know, like some ASEAN country, they always wanted to restore the situation prior to the military coup. But I think after a while, China gave up that hope. And then China is more concerned with the, their own Chinese uh, investment interests and, and geostrategical interests. So I think China is shifting lately Uh, to take stand with the with the with the military uh, uh, rather than to sit on the fence. That's what they did in the initial period of the in the, in the aftermath of the military coup. So right now, I think China is getting worried. I mean, when you look at the when you look at the statistic in the Yunnan province and and the Lanchang, uh, about 49 or 50 people got infected with COVID on the July 18. Um, majority of them are Chinese citizens returned from Myanmar. So, so, so you, you can easily imagine this is official statistic, like other authoritarian countries. You can you can imagine how and and, and the reporting and, and reporting. So I think right. China and all these neighboring countries must have a serious interest to to address like Myanmar's COVID pandemic. So that's their interest. That's why the Myanmar stakeholders, including NUG or the, the the military and the civil society, we should consider how to. How to, um, how to activate the, the interests of the regional countries and how to activate the norms and values of the United Nations and you know, UK and the EU and all these countries to come up together and to support uh, you know, Myanmar humanitarian you know, like the, the, the assistance, uh, the mission. Uh, I think this, is the, this should be the first steps. Then, then that could probably lead to what broader and better Uh, you know, like the, 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 the resolution. That's what we could see in the, uh, we, we already saw in the Aceh and Nepal, right? Sometimes these humanitarian crises uh, uh, could lead to, uh, you know, like political resolution. But I don't, I, I don't, I don't you know, like uh, expect that, you know, too, too prematurely though. Thank you very much. Uh, we uh, have to conclude before we can uh, really Uh, give uh, the floor to the public and uh, the questions. There are many questions uh, coming. We still have to address, uh, to talk about the economic crisis that is uh, unfolding uh, right now. I don't know if um, Ambassador Le Charvi had also uh, some uh, precision uh, about the, uh, the economic crisis. But, but before that, I think Dr. Uh, Rémi and Guyenne, um, I had a very simple question for you. Um, is it still ethical, is it still possible uh, for a foreign company to make a business today in, in Myanmar, uh, Dr. Rémi and Guyenne? Um, thank you very much, uh, Carol, for, for your question. Um, Uh, in my point of view, the decline uh, of the judiciary system in Myanmar uh, after the coup does not help uh, welcoming foreign investments. Uh, I'm not an economist, 
uh, so it may be difficult for me to analyze uh, any figures. However, uh, as a legal consultant in Myanmar, uh, I observe that it is extremely complicated uh, to uh, implement any business in the country uh, due to the armed uh, conflict, uh, banking issues, uh, and the COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, and if uh, doing business is not easy uh, in Myanmar, uh, another obstacle is ethical issues uh, faced uh, by uh, foreign uh, companies, um, especially uh, regulations coming from uh, uh, American, British, Canadian, Australian, uh, New Zealander, and uh, European, uh, um, European Union. Um, on the regional basis, uh, ASEAN did not uh, specify uh, any uh, sanctions. Uh, as um, uh, Min-Hu uh, said, um, the ASEAN on 24 April 2021 uh, just produced uh, five uh, key points. Um, in comparison uh, with uh, EU, uh, EU on 22 April 2013, uh, EU lifted all restrictive measures against Myanmar uh, except for the arms embargo, export ban of uh, dual use goods uh, for your use uh, by the military and border guard of police, uh, export restrictions uh, on equipment for monitoring communications and the embargo on equipment that may be used for internal uh, repression. Uh, on, uh, uh, in April 2018, the EU uh, foreign ministers and the Council of the EU adopted additional measures against senior military officers uh, of the Myanmar Armed uh, Force. Uh, on 22 March 2021, uh, they imposed restrictive uh, measures on uh, 11 individuals responsible for the military coup stage in Myanmar on 1st April, February 2021, uh, and the subsequent military and, and police repression against peaceful uh, demonstrators. Uh, 10 of the 11 persons targeted belong to the highest uh, ranks of the Myanmar Armed Force. Uh, including uh, the Tanmado uh, Commander in Chief uh, Ming Aung Lai. Uh, on uh, 9, 19 April 2021, uh, EU decided to sanction 10 individuals and two military control companies uh, Myanmar Economic Holdings Public Company Limited and Myanmar Economic Corporation Limited. Uh, lastly, on 21st uh, June 2021, uh, uh, the Council of the EU has imposed asset freezes and travel bans on eight individuals and four entities in relation to the, uh, to the uh, military coup. Um, so the designated people and enterprise uh, uh, are as uh, follows, um, such as uh, Lieutenant General Sotut, uh, the um, uh, Minister for Natural uh, Resources of, uh, and Environmental Conservation, Minister for Planning, Finance, Industry, uh, other companies uh, such as uh, Myanmar James Enterprise, Myanmar Timber Enterprise, uh, Forest Products Joint, Joint Venture Corporation uh, Limited. So the sanctions uh, adopted by uh, EU uh, are ac actually quite similar uh, with uh, the US uh, and the UK. So we can see that uh, um, due, to, um, um, due to the organization uh, and uh, different uh, principles um, applied in ASEAN and EU, uh, sanctions also uh, are totally different. Uh, no sanction from ASEAN and um, uh, sanctions from, uh, from EU. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think now it's time to um, take questions for, uh, from our audience. Uh, I have to say that um, most of the questions are around the, the COVID situation and uh, this is not surprising. Uh, like uh, we said in the beginning, this is really the most urgent, uh, the most emergency situation uh, right now. I want to add something. It is possible for our Burmese um, participants to ask questions in Burmese if they wish, uh, because we have an interpreter uh, working on the ground. So, or whether on the chat box or even with the sound, if possible, we will have a simultaneous uh, translation. So, uh, question in English and Burmese are uh, welcome. Uh, first, so let, let's uh, go back to this COVID uh, situation that is really uh, worrying people on the ground. Um, we, we, we talked about it a little bit in the, in the beginning, but how we have a question from Jean-Raphael uh, Petrunier. 
uh, how is the COVID situation affecting the population, the uprising of the population against the military? And what is the first priority, fighting the COVID or fighting the military? Uh, who would like to, to answer that question? If uh, nobody uh, volunteers, I will have to uh, go by name. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Mayu, are you here? What's the first priority? Uh, well, I don't. Uh, I, I I wish we were that lucky to to choose one or the other, or to to do to go first uh, one first and the other later. But uh, uh, since the two problems are uh, intertwined uh, and interrelated, if, if we cannot solve uh, these pro if we are if we cannot address uh, these two problems simultaneously, we are still going to suffer. So I, uh, unfortunately, I think to the people of Burma, we do not have uh, this luxury to choose which one first. We will have to tackle both. Both must go so that our country will have a chance. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, another question uh, from M. Uh, the root cause of the problem is uh, the, the military. They oppress uh, the medical workers and volunteers. Um, and the oxygen is the first priority right now, in my opinion. Uh, Minzin, maybe uh, can you do a, a two in one, maybe answer the first question, what is the first priority fighting COVID or fighting the military? And then uh, maybe in regard to this question about the army, this is a topic that um, we are preparing this uh, meeting. We say we uh, should find an occasion to, to talk about. In a more general way, maybe, what is the, the place of the army in, in, in Burmese society? Is it really this state in a state that have been described or is the relationship with the civil society more complex or allow me to be blunt maybe, uh, do Burmese people hate their military? Uh, this is a um, many questions in one for you, Minzin. I think um, the, the, the current, I would say the, the, the legitimacy, right? The, the public cooperation and public support for the, for the military uh, to me is, uh, is a historically unprecedentedly low, probably the lowest um, you know, in the modern history that as a, the, the people in power, which uh, even fail to, uh, fail to activate their own Patriational work, you know. Usually, the, the the Burmese ruler since the Burmese kingdom um, uh, from Bagan, uh, they even they don't they don't they, they don't usually seek the the broader general population supports, but they they at least manage to activate their own patron client network vis-a-vis -vis religious leader, vis-a-vis -vis business leader, vis-a-vis -vis the 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 culture uh, leaders. But this time, I think the Burmese military. Uh, after six months of the military coup, they still have a hard time to manage even to set up a music association group. When you set up the music association group today, the next day, the appointed chair resign. So this is a serious issue. This is a legitimacy crisis. With this type of legitimacy deprivation, how you could mobilize the whole of the government approach, the whole of the society approach to address COVID-19. So I think it's so important for all of us and also international community to see the five point that that the consensus of consensus of ASEAN as a like uh, each of these points should not be viewed as an isolated you know uh, matter. For example, like you can address humanitarian issue in isolated manner. No, you have to make a connection this humanitarian issue to the politics but not necessarily partisan politics, right? But it's so important, uh, for example, like the military and uh, those who hold the arms, ethnic armed groups or whoever, should make a humanitarian pledge, right? You're not going to disrupt. You're not going to harass. You're not going to rechannel the resources provided by the international community for the people of Myanmar, right? Basically means you don't ship all these uh, assistance to the military hospital. So that's what we all need to 
ask the stakeholders to pledge. Otherwise, the, I think the, the half of the population will be likely to be infected if we fail to stop this uh, pandemic. So I think it's, it's so important to see as a package D, you know, not as an isolated, but let's, let's start with the humanitarian issue. Like, you know, leave it alone the, the healthcare workers who are being arrested and imprisoned and on the run. No, if you want to address this problem, you must release all of these healthcare workers who are in the prison. You must drop charges against these healthcare workers. Otherwise, you can do it, right? So that, that's why it's important for the military to see the, the gravity of this crisis and then, and then acknowledge they won't be able to address, they are not capable to address, address this issue on their own. So I think that's, that's why I'm, I'm repeating that it's important to see every solution as a package, as the interlink you know, uh, 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 approach, uh, multi-sectoral, multi, uh, you know, like a uh, layer approach. Thank you very much, Mindin. Uh, Claire Tran, uh, director of uh, IRASEC, would like uh, uh, to uh, take the floor. Please, Claire. Yes, it was, uh, I see uh, uh, among the questions, a lot of questions about the vaccine. Um, uh, somebody uh, asked, is, uh, are, uh, does China send vaccine to Myanmar? But uh, Another participant also uh, from Myanmar, uh, uh, he's talking from Myanmar, he asked if the, the Western country will help them to have vaccine. And I would like to ask to the, the French ambassador, uh, what is uh, the policy of the EU uh, um, regarding the vaccine? We know that all the country in Southeast Asia have problems to have this vaccine. It's not only the case of uh, Myanmar, but in the case of Myanmar, what can uh, France and what can uh, the EU uh, uh, do for um, sending the, 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 the vaccine. But the issues also, as uh, Minzin said, is uh, we need, they need also uh, medical doctors to do the, all this, uh, this campaign of vaccination. And if the, 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 the nurse and the, the, the doctors are in jail, how to do? So, but just uh, if uh, um, Ambassador Le Charvi can uh, have to say something about these issues of vaccine. Well, first, first of all, the um, health um, problem is um, a major issue all over the, ter the territory. Uh, we we are in a situation uh, very different with the second and the first and the, and the first wave. Uh, of course, uh, the major cluster are in Bago regions and 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 um, and, 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 and Yangon, but um, the. Um, the, the spread of the of the COVID-19 cover all the country. All the country. The first objective, as I think, is uh, is to limit uh, the cluster, and um, the, the first cluster uh, to to control is uh, the hospital and clinics uh, to protect the else uh, else wor else worker, um, because uh, without uh, doctors and nurses, it will be fully impossible to implement any 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 policy. So that the first uh, urgent uh, urgent urgency. Uh, the second second one is uh, to limit the cluster we we exist, and, and we know that even the Tatmadaw faces some difficulties on, on these matters. There is a cluster inside the police, there is a cluster inside the military, there is a cluster uh, uh, in uh, about jails and, and, and few other and few other few other places, um, including uh, monastery. Uh, that's why how to limit all this cluster uh, is a second uh, second second element. Certainly, uh, and and one of the main problem, they have no time to organize. Um, quarantine center as uh, they have done uh, during the second uh, the second wave. Uh, that's why <clears throat> for, for the time being you have to treat the people uh, at home as, pos as, po as possible as possible uh, and uh, that's the the, 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 the limits uh, because uh, you need the mobility of your doctors and uh, and, 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 and nurse <coughs> on the international community I think there is a will on the EU side. We are not in the, in the, in the position to add another crisis uh, to the political crisis. I think there is no will to uh, create more problems through 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 else. But uh, we need uh, some action from the government 
some information about their own strategy. And uh, without this uh, element, it will be very difficult to implement international solidarity. Uh, that's why there is a global fund uh, team came in IPDO a few a few days ago. There is uh, still ongoing discussions with uh, WHO and, and the others, uh, the, the COVAX uh, process, pro, 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 process uh, to try to define uh, what is the necessity uh, including in terms of oxygen, uh, what, what is the exact demand uh, from the local authorities, and we need to receive this information from uh, the local uh, the local authorities. But for the vaccine, I think we need to be very clear: uh, it will take time, uh, a long time. We are facing a long-standing uh, crisis uh, in January. Uh, the plan from the government was to vaccine something around 15 million people. We are very far from this reality. Even if vaccine arrive from China or even in Russia in the coming in, in the coming in in, in the coming weeks, that's why I think uh, again uh, the vaccination is just an element of answer. Is not the only solutions, uh, but uh, uh, again uh, the the. the the, uh, the state uh, need to be more transparent, uh, need to define uh, his uh, strategy and define uh, his, uh, his, pri his priority. Without that, I think it's difficult to, to answer. Even if we observe on the ground some uh, private answers uh, coming from the civil society organizations and uh, in, in NGOs and try to find a way and, and uh, the government need to recognize this reality and don't fight uh, this, uh, these people. Uh, several people ask, is there a plan, uh, maybe not from uh, the European Union for now because of uh, many restrictions as uh, Ambassador Lashavi just explained, but is there a plan from China to send out uh, more vaccine to uh, Myanmar? Uh, who has the, 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 the answer to that? We talked a lot recently about the, the vaccine diplomacy from China in, in Southeast uh, Asian region. Uh, is this happening with, uh, with uh, Myanmar too? Is, uh, is, is China sending out uh, vaccine to Myanmar? And, in, and if not, what, what, what could be uh, the, 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 the reason? Does somebody uh, wish to answer that, uh, that question? Or I will go by name, and this is going to be Minzin uh, about uh, the Chinese uh, vaccine diplomacy to uh, to Myanmar. Does it exist or not? I think before we like talk about Chinese vaccine diplomacy, even China already, uh, you know, like uh, 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 you know, like administer uh, Sinovac in the northern and northeastern part of Myanmar. Uh, through the ethnic armed uh, organizations. So uh, some, some significant population in the north and northeast, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, got uh, vaccinated uh, with the Sinovac. But as you all know, uh, from Indonesia to Thailand to Singapore, the, the credibility you know, and reliability and the quality of Sinovac is, is, is a big question. So I'm not, I'm not like uh, s s politicizing this issue. This is a serious issue. You are injecting the virus in your body. You cannot say something is better than nothing, right? It must be totally quality uh, assurance. So that's a very important part. So, so for us, I think um, it is so important. I mean, let alone Chinese, uh, let alone Russian, you know, vaccine. Uh, so we need to be very careful uh, to, to receive you know, like to standardize, you know, that's a, that's a the quality uh, vaccination. Uh, as far as I know, the military recently announced that they expect the half of the population, you know, like out of 52 million, half of the population will be vaccinated by the end of this year. I don't see uh, this uh, possible. Uh, after talking to different exports, uh, uh, what I learned is, uh, that at most, what Myanmar could manage to do is whatever vaccine it is, for the more than 60% of population to get vaccinated, it will be only possible by 2023 or beyond. Even Economic Intelligence Unit 
respectable research institute, EIU, predicted Nima will get more than 60% of the Myanmar population will get vaccinated only by 2025 and beyond. So it's, it's this very challenging situation for us. That's why I think it's so important as the ambassador noted, we need ASEAN or some international, not just bilateral issue, this is multilateral initiative what we need. We need rapid assessment team visiting Myanmar right now and then making an assessment, you know, what happened, you know, what do we need? Then that's that's a matter of public health policy maker and public health uh, people to make decision. But what the politicians and armed group need to do is to stay away from them, not to repress them, not to bother, harass, you know, interrupt, disrupt, rechannel, corrupt. That's what they need to stay away from. So I think we need to make it very clear uh, what Myanmar need is uh, uh, not just bilateral support, but from multilateral initiative. Uh, that we really need right away this rapid emergency assessment team need to be uh, dispatched to Myanmar right away. Uh, we have a several question about the R2P responsibility to protect. Uh, some are uh, nicely worded, like uh, the one from my uh, colleague, Tom Fortrop. What do you mean by R2P? Uh, of course, a military R2P is out of the question, but would be a humanitarian intervention possible? Others are more um, strongly worded. I think uh, one of the participants uh, said the Burmese people realize that R2P is total bullshit to uh, quote him or her. Uh, Mutro, do you have the feeling that uh, because of all this good declaration of intention of the Western country and support and support and moral support, but no intervention at all at the end, uh, did Burmese people lose uh, any hope, uh, any... Um, did UN lose any credibility uh, uh, with the Burmese people uh, right now, and maybe especially with the, with the Burmese youth? What, what is the feeling right now among uh, Burmese population? Is there still, do they still expect anything from the UN? Uh, I think uh, with the particularly with the United Nations, uh, the Burmese population has uh, has lost uh, faith a long time ago. Uh, it's not just now. Uh, it's uh, now it's just a reminder. So it's a painful reminder how UN has failed. Uh, and if especially if you talk about the population that belongs to uh, uh, like not at the power group, the non-state, uh, non-state uh, groups, uh, it's even worse. But the Burmese people in general, especially the young people, uh, are uh, adhering to many of, uh, voluntarily obliging themselves to many of international principles, international human rights law, uh, international you know, norms and values, not because they have, they have any kind of particular hope uh, in international institution, but these values, these norms are good ones that we as human being, a member of human society, we have to adhere to, we have to uphold. But other than that, I do not believe that, I, or I do not have a sense from my uh, experience living in the country or in, uh, working with the people in the country uh, that they have any particular hope uh, in international institutions such as United Nations. But saying that, it doesn't mean it doesn't reduce the responsibility from the international community, international institutions like the UN. Uh, uh, if we want to do, if the states, UN is a bunch of states. Uh, so if the states want to do something good, we can move from rhetoric to reality, uh, uh, rhetoric to practice. And it's not a rocket science for a country like Burma. Uh, they can do that. But I think uh, we are uh, suffering from shortage of political will. Thank you. Uh, just to, because you mentioned, uh, we just mentioned Burmese youth, and I, I would not want to close this debate uh, without talking about this uh, very brave, uh, very uh, amazing Burmese youth we have seen uh, fighting in the streets. And my question for, for you, uh, Mayu, would be, could you explain how this youth, uh, this Burmese youth is uh, different today from the, the, the president generation and maybe for giving a, a note of hope because uh, we all need it. 
why maybe uh, this youth has a chance to succeed where the previous generation has failed? Uh, personally, uh, working with the youth uh, and uh, having, uh, uh, yeah, having worked with uh, some youth organizations, and looking, observing uh, the youth participation in the current uh, revolution, uh, I, I can see, I belong to 1988 generation, uh, I can see striking difference. Uh, at least one striking difference that I could see is that the youth these days are more informed, uh, better informed, more informed, and more attuned to international global setting. Uh, than our generation in back in 1988. So uh, aside from not having uh, any faith at all whatsoever in international institutions, uh, I think the youth uh, in the, revol the current revolution uh, are aware of the global uh, community, the values that these uh, men, uh, these communities are striving for. And uh, so I, I think this is a plus. Uh, for for in a difficult time uh we are upholding uh, uh values that we did not see uh unprecedentedly we did not we've never seen in burma uh defending uh human rights speaking up for minorities uh, sh uh admitting uh, the wrongs, these kind of things. I think uh, first time in the history of the country that we see young people speaking out and speaking out on the side of the oppressed, on the side of the, peop uh, the people who, are being, who have been marginalized. So I think that uh, we, uh, if we have to uh, take any aspiration from this and any built hope on this, uh, we can, this is a point from where, from which we could grow. Uh, all other things that the bleakness about this country, uh, yes, uh, we talk about and we can feel discouraged, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think if we look at the youth and their awareness and their commitment to a change society, this, uh, I think this is a point where we, we, we could grow. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, everybody, for uh, this uh, discussion. It was uh, really interesting, very enriching. I personally learned a lot. Um, I would like to end uh, on that uh, note uh, about uh, Burmese uh, youth uh, before, uh, of course, uh, giving uh, the floor to uh, Claire Tran, who will uh, close this session. Uh, I don't know if Ambassador Le Chavis had a, a last uh, closing uh, word uh, first. Uh, Ambassador, did you, did you have a last uh, word? Maybe not. Uh, if that's not it. Um, Something about uh, diplomatic solution, said, maybe? Well, a, a diplomatic solution, I think, is um, um, if there is a political process, if there is a political process, I think. Uh, the, the political solution is in the end, by definitions uh, of the Myanmar uh, people. And uh, without a will uh, from the different party, it will be uh, difficult uh, to build something. That's why um, we, we are watching what is going on on, on a regular basis, try to create the conditions of, of, the, of, of, the, of, the, of dialogue. But uh, again, the solution is not from the international community, but from the Myanmar, uh, from Myanmar people. And in this perspective, it's, it's so important to maintain our intentions, uh, repeat our concern about uh, how, what is going on on, 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 on on the ground. And that's why it's so important that a webinar like this one uh, will be organized on, on a regular basis. Uh, by Irasek, uh, as I said, in, in, in Chiang Mai and, and, and in, Thai, uh, in, in Thai institutions, uh, because it's a common, uh, it's a common con concern, and there is uh, enough blood uh, on on the ground since uh, the, 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 the beginning. Uh, and, and, and again, um, I think uh, our role is to speak about the situations, to speak about the people, how they say and see uh, their, uh, their future and uh, try to define with them uh, a solidarity uh, process. When we are talking about the humanitarian situations 
Of course, we have to take in consideration the consequence of the COVID-19, uh, but there are also other dimensions uh, in terms of uh, human assistance. We need to remember that since the beginning of the military coup, 200,000 uh, the new uh, IDP uh, in this uh, in these countries, and some of them are in very difficult situations. The economic crisis create a new poverty, poverty uh, in the rural areas, but also in the urban uh, regions. And we we have to find a way uh, to support these people, of course, in terms of uh, health assistance, but also in a very concrete term uh, to feed. Uh, a million uh, people. That's why uh, uh, take care of, of the situations, um, but also uh, take uh, um, the time to see uh, what is going on and, and, and then say publicly uh, what you observe. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you all for this. Uh, Fascinating debate. I will uh, now give the floor uh, for a, a few uh, closing words to uh, Claire Tran, the director of the IRASEC. Yes, uh, the closing word will be for Achan Chayan, but I will just uh, uh, I will, I will just uh, say some words to say. First of all, uh, thank you to uh, the French ambassador for his participation, his active participation and his word. Um, and uh, thank you also to uh, my colleague Achan Chayan and his team and all the, 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 the colleagues, uh, the Burmese colleagues uh, uh, and the students also uh, in Chiang Mai, but also in, in, in Myanmar. I know that, and I'm very happy that this conference uh, you will make possible to translate uh, in, in Burmese. Um, I would like to, to also thank the speakers, uh, uh, Carol, for his uh, uh, really great uh, um, this, uh, she managed the, the debate really remarkably, and uh, um, I would like to thank the, the audience for all their questions. And to finish, I would like to finish uh, as you finish uh, uh, yourself, uh, Carol, about the youth. Uh, so we spoke about so many uh, um, difficult issues: uh, the, the political crisis, the economic crisis, the health crisis. But the issue also is the youth, and also his. Uh, its right to uh, for education, and I know that uh, it's really the great concern of Ajahn Chayan uh, to to work on that. And uh, I hope really that in the next future, uh, IRSEC and other institution in France, uh, university in France, will be able to build uh, um, to reinforce uh, networks to uh, help um, our uh, your uh, the the. the uh, Myanmar used to 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 uh, also to, to to have the right to 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 study even in so difficult context. So uh, and I let just the floor now to uh, Ajahn Chayan to uh, for the closing remarks to this uh, uh, debate. Well, I I don't have much to say, but I really appreciate. <clears throat> all the speakers and particularly the ambassador to or French ambassador to Myanmar for uh, insightful uh, comments and and suggestion uh, I thank you very much for Carol for moderate this session beautiful beautifully and also thank you the audience for joining us until the end of our webinar like Mr. Ambassador suggested uh, this is not the only one web webinar that we will organize. We hope that we can organize this kind of webinar uh, more often so that we can follow follow uh, and understand uh, the, situa the situation in Myanmar better than, better than this. Thank you very much. So thank you to all of you, and uh, uh, we wish we can uh, continue to organize this seminar, this webinar together. So one more time, thank you so much to all of you.
for being uh, for participating in in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.